welcome everyone, both uh, everyone in the room and those joining us virtually. I'm going to begin this afternoon by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm Rosie Hicks, I'm the CEO of the Australian Research Data Commons and ARDC is enabled by the federal government's NCRIS program, that's the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. And our mission is to accelerate research and, in and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data assets. Welcome to the second leadership forum for 2024. These events allow us to bring people together to discuss the importance of the highly skilled research infrastructure workforce and recognize the role it plays in enabling world-class research. So recently, the Minister for Education, Jason Clare, was quoted as saying, and I think you're all gonna know this, as a country, we do 3% of the global research. 3% from a country that accounts for only 0.3% of the world's population. We punch well above our weight in research and innovation. We've heard this. Um, he was quoting it on the 7th of February earlier this year. But how do we do this? How does Australia punch above its weight? In a good part, Australia thrives because of the often under-recognised contribution made by the digital research infrastructure workforce. Just six months ago, the Department of Education released a draft National Digital Research in Infrastructure Strategy, NDRIS, uh, for consultation. That's quite a mouthful there. The first key outcome I identified was to meet the growing demand for a diverse but highly specialised expert workforce that's able to maintain and operate NDRI, maximising the value of capital investment. And this underscores just how important the critical workforce is to unlocking the full potential of research infrastructure to drive groundbreaking data-enabled research. The digital research infrastructure workforce builds the bridge between research infrastructures and their user communities, the researchers themselves, using specialist expertise, they provide smooth and efficient delivery of equipment, of platforms, of services, and the tools that ensure researchers can effectively access, manage, and analyze data. By handling the technical complexities, they free up researchers' valuable time, many of you in the room, I'm sure, are aware of this, and enable their expertise to be applied what they what they do best, allowing researchers to do what they do best. A formidable responsibility, equipping this essential workforce with the right skills and training is key to success. So too is establishing that pipeline of talent for future growth. So today, we have a challenge for our panel to tease out and identify the digital research skills that are essential for this workforce? What are the training frameworks needed to support sustainable career pathways and develop a workforce whose mix of skills we all know can be quite niche? Now at this point, I'm gonna break from the script and thank today's panel, which has had some very last minute adjustments. Uh, the reason this is possible is because we all care so passionately about this particular topic. ARDC as well. Successive research um, skills, uh, the annual symposiums have enabled us to build a digital research skills framework, front of mind for years. In fact, I think the framework was pu first published uh, in 2021. Now, we have this available on our website. I can see, Lauren, you're busy taking photos. That's fine, we'll sort it out. Um, <laughs> and this is only a part of it. I'm gonna show you a little bit more, but it's the basis for analyzing 
the digital research skills that are needed by the sector. And it's got a number of different components. The framework, it opens the door to new skills-based approaches uh, for workforce development strategies, skills training and learning pathways, and policy development and implementation. The framework was born out of wide consultations held at successive ARDC Digital Research Skills Summits with the training community and with institutional partners. And of course, today is the first day of the 2024 summit. So the consultations were focused on how we can have the biggest impact on skills uplift for Australian researchers. This is a component uh, behind me. This is another component. There's a few of them. Um, I am going completely off script here because I, th I think this is a really key component. Sorry, Catherine. <laughs> what the skills framework enables us to do is to consider who needs what skills and really critically, who's responsible for providing those skills to a researcher, to a research infrastructure professional, is it the institutions? Is it NCRIS facilities? We're joined by Tim Rawling, the director of Oscope, on the panel today. Thank you, Tim. Is it the ARDC itself? The skills framework that was first published in 2021 is not a static document. So I'm showing you a key component of the structure here. Um, this is a slide, the next slide's going to blow your mind. That doesn't meet the ease of reading but it is critical. So we'll make sure this is available for people, but it's not static. We come back to this year after year to test it with the community and understand how things are changing. And in fact, ARDC's work in this space is recognized internationally. And we're in current discussions with the Canadian and, and European counterparts as they're also interested in implementing the ARDC's skills framework and learning from the approaches that ARDC has taken in this national skills space. Closer to home, we're also keen on having discussions with other NCRIS organisations, such as Oscope, um, and others with an aim of thinking about what's required under the government's next research infrastructure investment plan. Um, what are the skills needs for our national research infrastructure workforce in the first instance? And the panel discussion today could well inform some of the thinking that goes into that proposal later in the year. No pressure, guys. Um, right, so on that note, I hope that I've been able to convey to you something of my, my deep passion and enthusiasm for using this framework as the basis for a national discussion. How do we advance this? I'm going to hand over to Professor Nick Geard from the School of Computing at uh, Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne, but most critically for today's discussion, Director of the Melbourne Data Analytics Platform. Um, Nick's own research interests, of course, focus on computer simulation and modelling and therefore are absolutely perfect uh, for today's discussion, which is lucky because Nick's only been the facilitator for about 24 hours. <laughs> Um, so we're very grateful, and um, I'm giving you license, Nick, to inject some of the careful preparation that you have <laughs> for being a panel member um, and share those thoughts also with us as a facilitator as well. So thanks, everyone, for joining us again. Um, I'm looking forward to a really stimulating discussion this afternoon, and I hope you all enjoy it very much as we, we come together to shape Australia's future in this space. Over to you, Nick. Thanks very much. Did you want to come sit up as well? Because I'll introduce you. Thank you very much, Rosie, and hello, everyone. Um, I, too, would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today, the, the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung, and the Bunurong peoples and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and future. So as Rodi, Rosie introduced me, I'm Nick Geard. I'm the director of the Melbourne Data Analytics Platform here at the University of Melbourne. 
um, and I also have an academic home in the School of Computing and Information Systems. And, uh, and Rosie and I probably should have spent a little bit longer comparing notes before we got up, because I'm going to cover a little bit of the same ground that she did. But I'm going to put a slightly different emphasis on it. Um, so the topic of the discussion today is that around the skilled research infrastructure workforce, and particularly the pathways that support and enable um, this workforce to continue to grow in supporting effective research and increasing research impact. Uh, it's clear that an increasing amount of research today, whether it be in academia or, or in industry, and across all of the different disciplines within an academia, is collaborative, it's multidisciplinary, it's digital, and it makes use of huge quantities of data. And that can be all the way from uh, cultural collections and archives through to the vast data sets that are generated by modern methods in genomics and astronomy and earth sciences. And so in order to maximize and make the most and sort of wend our way through the complexity of all of these new and emerging data sets, we really do need a, a skilled workforce who are able to support researchers in, in their aims. And, and I also want to highlight the fact that within that uh, uh, Department of Education's National Digital Research Infrastructure Strategy, um, workforce was listed as the number one priority uh, right at the top of the list. And I think it, it is clear that it sort of underpins all of the other uh, ways, shapes and forms, all of the other aims that that uh, strategy may have. From my perspective in um, MDAP, I think we sit very much at the uh, on the researcher end of the infrastructure. We were at that front coalface of working with uh, researchers directly, collaborating to in order to enable them to access the infrastructure, access the skills, access the multidisciplinary and collaborative sort of conceptual frameworks that enable them to increase their impact. And so I see the development of the workforce both in terms of how we create the next generation of research data specialists who um, provide that service to researchers. But I also see it extending as a responsibility for the researchers themselves, the users of our research infrastructure. And the way that MDAP works with researchers is very collaboratively in order to upskill that user uh, workforce as well. In addition to focusing on the pipeline and working closely with students and the, uh, you know, the emerging workforce who are going to uh, be moving into spaces which are changing all of the time. The strategy also identifies a range of different challenges that are going to be confronting us as we uh, aim to secure that digital workforce. All the way from uh, thinking about the rapidly changing and increasingly complex uh, environment in which that uh, workforce must uh, work, um, through to the, you know, the, the rapidly changing sort of um, uh, types of digital technologies that are um, in play in that workforce. However, of course, wherever that we see challenges, we can also identify those opportunities. And so today what we're looking forward to is really learning about how specific challenges are being confronted in specific instances by our four panelists. Uh, and to, through conversation with one another, start to share that knowledge with each other, start to identify where there are new opportunities to work together, to share information, and to um, improve the way that we uh, uh, create and, and explore those pathways for workforce development. So I'll ask the panel to tell them a little bit more about their experiences and, and digital research infrastructure workforce in a moment, but to just introduce them briefly, um, on the uh, right, uh, left for you, we have Julie Rothaker, who's the Director of Major External Projects Government in the Office of the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research and Enterprise at the Australian Catholic University. Um, then. Uh, to her left, Professor Helen Thompson, who's the Director of the Centre for E-Research and Digital Innovation at Federation University, which focuses on multidisciplinary research. Then t Dr. Tim Rawling, who's the CEO of Oscope, an NCRIS platform which provides research infrastructure to the national geoscience community. And finally, Professor David Powell, Director of the Monash E-Research Centre, uh, a long-standing research platform dedicated to advanced computing uh, in research. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists up front, but I'll now invite um, uh, Julia to begin, uh, so yes, Julia to begin uh, by giving us an overview of a research challenge confronting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I do uh, concur with uh, Rosie. This is a really important topic. Um, so my role, I've spent uh, probably 14 years at Monash University up until the end of last year, working at and developing models to support researchers 
um, and provide the skills and access to research infrastructure. Now, a main component of that, of course, was the digital research environment. Um, the, the challenge, I think, um, came about is really the speed of which the, the skills needed to move and have moved over the last sort of five, ten years, whilst um, trying to keep up with technology, that also um, outpaced the digital skills, uh, outpaced the technology uh, as it moved. So we were looking at how do we keep ahead of the game at that leading edge, but still be able to develop the skills and tools to help the everyday researcher across the university and translate that knowledge. And so I think one of the, the major challenges that was around how do you put together a, a platform or but a model around people uh, that is hard to, to fund often, um, that's not the same as a technology platform. And so that was um, something I think I saw the evolution which of the e-research platform at Monash, the development of the bioinformatics platform. And I think David brought the brunt of actually doing a lot of those things and I'm sure he'll talk about that. But also what's that next skill in terms of trying to stand up an AI machine learning sort of type of capability and keeping at that leading edge. Um, and, and that was very much challenging. I think also an observation over that time really saw the, the recognition of that value add that these skills give to research projects. And I sort of see it as an analogy to the commercialization pathway of being able to, to keep technology within the organisation to develop it further, to increase its value um, and, and to be able to supply better investment. And our researchers need that. Um, they need that end sort of uh, analysis and pathways uh, we're seeing a growth in image, you know, image technology, image analysis, uh, and then of course AI, machine learning coming into that. So how do you build that value add when projects are funded? Um, that's a small component of the overall research funding. And so we're seeing people funded partly by little bits of grants. And, and so that retention and job security is a real challenge. Um, I think where we saw some real success for big research groups that were successful with funding, just saw that value of those skills and would often, you know, take good people and thrive within that environment and they built a really dedicated skill set in there. So that breadth of skills across a university and across a research portfolio is really hard to build that then depth. Um, I'm now um, taking a role of Director of um, Major External Programs at Australian Catholic University, looking, going from a really large university, but also the challenges are the same within a small university. We don't have dedicated e-research teams, but we still need to find that skill set. I've got a, you know, building up a new research portfolio um, and growing what are those foundational pieces that we can lean into this community, make sure that we're you know, operating at best practice, we've got all the, the security governance data considerations. So it, it's a totally different challenge that I've got now, but um, definitely seeing those skill sets um, really important, um, but particularly AI. Um, the, the skills and knowledge that we need, but also from our research of how we then teach the next generation of teachers and students and things in that space. So that full life cycle and um, skill set goes across so many areas and um, they were probably the, the main challenges in there of how we really do take that knowledge creation, keep on the leading edge, but also um, build that back into best practice across the sector. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Yes, our context is, is probably a bit different than some of the university and national research infrastructure facilities. We're more at the impact uh, end in some ways in terms of translating uh, some of these opportunities to the, to the local government and catchment management authority and, and other uh, national partners that we work with in, in the agriculture sector. And so over time, the skills we've needed to support them on their on their data management journey has changed. So 
Uh, you know, in the team that I lead at the Centre for Research and Digital Innovation, we have about 35. Um, but there's data policy managers, there's in a, hard, a team of uh, 10 hardcore techs, and even their skills, as you've said, have had to change quite significantly, uh, you know, over the 20 plus years that we've been on this, on this journey. Um, you know, whether the context is to help um, citizen science groups to bring together the data that's already known about species in our region and then to add to that with their own local data, uh, whether it's about working with uh, custodians of, of on-farm trial information and, and supporting those, um, you know, 80 plus organisations who undertake those trials around Australia in, in generating high quality consistent metadata, you know, around those trials so that others can find out about the research that's being undertaken um, and make better decisions in terms of what I might sow in my, in my farm in, in this type of season. So um, what we've found has been really effective is partnerships, you know, to partner with, whether it's um, CSIRO and infrastructure that they develop, like the Spatial Information Services stack, you know, to adopt and adapt infrastructure that's already been developed in the research sector. Um, also to partner with skills. Um, so some of the way that our team has been supported in growing their skills in areas like data and data interoperability has been by um, capturing some people towards the end of their careers and um, giving them, uh, you know, flexible sort of uh, uh, employment at the FTE that they like. And, um, you know, again, um, uh, you know, whether it's been from CSIRO or state government departments, uh, you know, these individuals have massive experti expertise and experience and, and, and they know what data exists where and they have the relationships to be able to unlock that. So, you know, before we get to the, the technology, the smart tech way of, of transforming um, the research sector through data, we have to have the social uh, relationships um, to, to enable that to happen and then show the benefit of that happening. So I suppose we've been on a long journey and, and I often describe what we do at, at our centre as the, the really unsexy end of, of research data and data infrastructure um, because it really is about, you know, working with um, custodians of data in all their forms, even private sector, um, you know, agricultural companies to see the benefit of of standardising the way that their data and information is stored so that it can actually be brought together really efficiently with other people's, you know, government and other uh, data, you know, to better answer in an evidence-based way the decisions. So, you know, from a skills perspective, I think one of the things in a multidisciplinary context is our team have lots of variety. It's, it's also a challenge because you, it takes time to build up deep expertise across lots of disciplines, but um, the other thing that's been really valuable is to be able to embed people from our team in other teams, you know, so through secondments, uh, with other research organisations, through the new arrangements that we have um, with ARDC, uh, you know, as a host partner, being able to, in some ways, provide new opportunities without those um, regional located people having to to leave and go to Melbourne, um, you know, or, or, or Sydney to pursue their career, that they can sort of start a new career without leaving um, our organisation. So, yeah, they're just a few observations, I suppose. Yeah, that's fantastic, thank you. I, I really like the, the emphasis on the, the social aspect of the skills as well, because I think when we think of skills, we think, tend to turn immediately to technical skills, but that's only a part of the equation when we're talking about this, um, you know, very embedded, applied, uh, data-driven research. Tim, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. So, um, as Rosie and Nick have already mentioned, I'm the director of OSCOP, which is uh, the NCRIS capability for the Earth and Geospatial Sciences. So, we're a research infrastructure like ARDC, but we're a little different in that we invest in, uh, infrastruct in hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. So, we have a number of analytical facilities. We have observational um, facilities like seismometers and magnetotellurics instruments and we have sensors all across the country, but we also develop codes uh, for simulation. We manage um, 
uh, databases and various other things like that. So it, we have a, a real breadth of uh, activities that we're a part of, um, but that spreads us a little thin. So I'll, I'll circle back into that in a minute. My background is as a structural geologist many years ago. I actually did my PhD at Monash, and I have a little story about that. When I finished my PhD, I was a bit pissed off at academia, and I got offered a job as a programmer with this startup that had been started up by this astrophysicist from Monash. And his philosophy was, it was just before Y2K, and it was all very exciting. Shows how old I am. And uh, his philosophy was, oh, if we just hire people with PhDs, we can teach anyone to program. And uh, so it, it was great fun for a while. There were linguists, there were linguists, there were structural geologists, there were astrophysicists. Turns out he wasn't right. Um, <laughs> structural geologists don't make great programmers. And uh, it was a wild ride, but it was a lot of fun in the tea room over lunch, I can tell you. Um, but that's part of the thing, right? Like, I think we're getting an evolving knowledge of what a digital research infrastructure specialist is, what somebody... They are very, very specialist skill set. We can't just create them out of nowhere. And so part of the problem that Oscope has is we're, we're a big, you know, well-funded research infrastructure. We um, have a very small office. So we're a not-for-profit company similar to the setup of some of the other research infrastructures, but we only have five people that are hired out of our head office. But we have 80 people that we pay salaries for across the country, and they're through our 22 partner organisations. So we have many universities, we have PFRAs, including CSIRO and Geoscience Australia. We have CRCs that we partner with. We now have, uh, we have state government um, uh, departments that we partner with. And we have museums now as well that we partner with. So there's uh, a whole bunch of different types of groups that we're working with to deliver our research infrastructures. And then within that, you know, a digital research infrastructure for one of those communities might be the high bandwidth optic fibre that comes from one of our radio telescopes and delivers data through to a, a data repository of some kind. Uh, for, another research, for another component of our research infrastructure, that might be this really long tail geochemistry data and how do we get data off these instruments, how do we process it, how do we store it in a repository so that it's publication ready. And you know, those skill sets are wildly different. And then the other problem is because we've got all these people spread across all of these organisations, you know, we actually don't have, uh, well, A, we don't have HR, um, you know, uh, authority over those people, so they're hired through our partners. So how do we as an organisation actually have any influence on how those groups hire, what their practices are, what their policies are around creating roles for digital research infrastructure specialists, you know, this pathway so that people can stay in these jobs? Um, it, it's very hard for us to influence them. So, you know, we can influence them with funding and with contracts and with carrot-flavoured sticks to try to encourage them to go down a path that we think uh, works. But it's very, very difficult. It's also really hard to identify, as I said, what a research infrastructure specialist for us is. So in some of our projects, that's a computer programmer, you know, with very specialist skills about doing some sort of simulation modelling or, you know, um, fluid dynamics or something like that. In another one of our projects, it's a data specialist, you know, a data scientist. Um, and because our projects aren't that big, uh, we don't tend to have the capacity to hire specific, you know, specialist um, digital research infrastructure specialists into each of those projects. So what we end up having to, well, not having to, what we end up dealing with is people who are domain specialists who are then picking up skills that are relevant to digital research infrastructure. And that typically is great because they're engaged and they want to learn those skills and they have enough knowledge to do things well. But it's not perfect because they don't have that really deep knowledge. So, you know, people are all talking about AI and ML and all of this stuff. But unless you really understand AI and ML, you're not the person to build the database to facilitate it, right? You might be the best geochemist in the world and have all the love of the geochemistry data and want to make that available. But you need to be able to partner those two people together. So I guess our philosophy at the moment is to try to teach the domain specialists enough and to provide the skills that they have a good knowledge of what's right and wrong, what fair is, what care is, you know, how do we implement these things properly. But also to partner them with these really, you know, deep digital uh, specialists who can then actually advise and build 
um, the, the technology that's going to allow the sort of next generation of processing and use of our data sets and data systems. So the approach that we're trying to take, and this is, this is new territory for us, is to centralise some of those roles. So we've created a role within HQ, which is our Director of Research Data Systems. Rebecca Farrington is uh, in that role. And she's trying to have a sort of a, an overview of everything that happens in this space across all of our projects. And then she's going to, hopefully, if we can fund this, we're going to find ways that she can bring some of these specialists in that can move across all of our projects and provide advice you know, at, at small um, levels. But we also see opportunities to work with ARDC to do this. So there's, there's a lot of capacity within the NCRIS ecosystem that allows us to do this stuff. So ARDC has enormous capacity in this space. So we're going to uh, use them where we can. Um, all of the supercomputing facilities have enormous capacity in this space. So we work closely with NCI and with PAUSI. And we use their knowledge of data, of, of cloud infrastructure and of HPC to be able to do the right thing with our data to enable it to be used in those environments as well. Um, so I think that that's the approach we're taking. Uh, we've got some other ideas that hopefully we can get into in the question time, but um, that's my overview. Great, fantastic, thank you. Um, and, I, and I think that really speaks to the strength of providing this type of infrastructure workforce as a platform. You know, there's no one person and distributed people who are operating in isolation can never meet all of the requirements, but having that team of people, and this is something that that MDAP uses as well is, is uh, creating small teams for projects where you bring together the person who has the domain expertise, the person who has the, the, the knowledge of data governance practices, and the person who has the deep technical expertise yeah. to then be able to combine those skill sets. And, and I think the internal upskilling that comes just from working together and collaborating together you know, enhances that uh, sort of ability to speak across those different, different uh, spheres. Um, great. Finally, we'll turn to uh, David uh, and Monash E-Research Centre. And thank you. A bit of an uh, until 24 hours ago, I was going to sit on that side, but uh, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> uh, it is something I care about a lot, so I do uh, appreciate being part of the conversation. Uh, so I'm director of the Monash E-Research Centre, which includes a team called Helix that is uh, targeted at software development for uh, sensitive data, and that is one particular skill set that we have in the team. And across the broader e-research group, we run computers, high performance, cloud, storage, and so we have some very deep technical skills in that team. We're also responsible for that engagement uh, through to researchers. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but before that, I spent, uh, so it's about 18 months I've been doing that role. For about seven years before that, I was uh, started the bioinformatics platform at Monash and grew that to a number of uh, bioinformaticians that supported Monash research. And so it's quite similar in that it's digital skills in the genomic space. Um, and, and the approach we took there was very deliberately that we needed a mix of skills, like we've talked about here, in computing, in biology, in statistics. How do we bring those people together on the projects? And so I did that for seven years and found that really quite challenging. Um, out of it, we realized one of the biggest problems was our researchers didn't have enough skills for us to work directly with and really bring the most value. So at that time, we co-founded a training initiative we called Monash Data Fluency uh, that trains somewhere around 1,000 people each year at Monash. Uh, I think it's about a third are staff that come along and get trained, and about two-thirds are higher education or higher degree students. Uh, and that is really important as part of that skills uh, pathway, I think, because it allows our researchers to learn a little bit more hopefully to transition to the part where maybe they can take part in a platform or one of the groups we have. Uh, and even if they can't, it does move that conversation in how we support them along a little bit so we can do a bit more. So that time with the bioinformatics platform was fun, rewarding, uh, challenging. And I moved to the research centre and now it's the whole university rather than just the med faculty. Uh, so it's a, a great challenge and I really enjoy it, but uh, it is difficult. We need skills across the board with a really lean budget. Uh, we don't have enough people ever, and I, I suspect this is true of everybody. So how do we do the best to support our researchers in the limited time and staff we have? The difficulty we have is that, uh, while well, 10 years ago perhaps, maybe 15, e-research was kind of a nice thing you had for some of your research programs on the side. But now the digital space underpins at least half of our research out of Monash. And so we can't just be a nice to have, it can't be on when we've got staff around, it needs to operate 24-7, seven days a week. Uh, and this is with staff that 
get paid to work nine to five <laughs> during the week. So luckily, we have great staff that are passionate about working with researchers. And I think this is one of the things that I think we really need to make sure we hit as a, uh, as a group. How do we make the use of it? Our staff are passionate to work in this space. Most of them aren't doing it for the money uh, while we are paid and uh, often reasonably well. We are not competing with industry uh, and we can't pretend to. But our staff do care about being able to make a difference in the research space. Um, before I came back to work at Monash, I was working for a, a small number of companies. I worked as a professional software developer. Um, I was reasonably well paid, but I got a little bit bored writing software for uh, big companies. And I had a colleague tell me, why do you want to get paid lots and get bored? You can come back and work at a university. And that's when I came back to Monash. Uh, and I thank him all the time. It was the best decision. I no longer bore myself to tears when I tell someone else what I do for a job. I actually really enjoy it and uh, find it quite engaging. But we need to be able to make sure our staff see that. And so how do we get our staff in front of our researchers better? And so I'm quite passionate about being there that our staff can see that we're on campus, Monash is big and we have a number of campuses, so we need to find multi uh, methods to be in front of the, those researchers and be accessible. Uh, but I really care about being visible and not just being having staff that are hidden away operating the storage or the compute. Uh, and, I, and there will be varying degrees of that across the team. Uh, some people will be very closely engaged with our researchers, others will be closer to the infrastructure. But I think it's everybody's responsibility in my team to be part of that engagement. Uh, in terms of some of those pathways I care about a lot, I don't think we do enough of that um, to make it clear that to our students, well, like Monash is a big university, we, we probably don't do as much as we could to make it clear that there is a pathway through this research support. And while it might not be that glamorous end of research, it is actually fun and really important work and we, we need to promote it more to the, the successes in that space so that our, our, uh, our staff feel valued and uh, from my point of view they do great work and are as dedicated as anybody I've seen around the university. Um, so I think that was all I was going to say there. Thank you very much and, and again I think uh, there's lots there to like in terms of um, the, the importance of actually getting yourself, getting your staff out in front of the, the university researchers. I think that's one of the challenges that we face as well is when we know that we can, can support people's research, um, but they don't yet realise that themselves. And I think actually can, you know, telling people, particularly who are not coming from an area like uh, bioinformatics or where they're aware that they can make use of that uh, research capacity, that it exists and that there is things that it can offer is a really challenging um, uh, 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 task. Okay. I believe at this point we are having a short tea break before we move on to the second half of the session. So we'll take a break for uh, 15 minutes or so, then we'll come back. Um, we'll continue the conversation. I've got a series of questions that I will ask the, um, uh, the, the panelists, and then there'll be an opportunity for audience members, both in the room and online, to ask questions as well. So uh, thank you very much to the panelists for your introductions so far, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. We're going to continue the session now just with um, a bit of Q&A with the panellists and uh, towards the end of the hour there will be an opportunity for um, the audience to pitch in with questions. So um, put your thinking caps on. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for Tim and we've talked quite a little bit in our introductions. We've identified a lot of the challenges associated with the, the skilled workforce. I was wondering if you could add a little bit perhaps on some of the things that you see as opportunities in this space at the moment. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I think we all probably touched on it a little bit. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the real challenges is losing really good people to better paid jobs, maybe more boring jobs, but still <laughs> when you're young and you've got some skills, <laughs> better paid looks good for a while. So how do we keep those people in, you know, the research, in, in my language, the digital research infrastructure space? Um, and, and I think that really is a challenge. So I think what we do need to do is create genuine pathways through the university, uh, you know, um, HR structure and allow people who are in these roles to see that they can create a career um, in that space rather than 
just having two or three years of funding to do something cool for a bit, knowing that they'll go and work at Defence or somewhere else after that. Um, so I think that that's the real challenge. And you know, there's been a fair bit of thinking within the NCRIS in you know community about how we can influence that. And many universities are taking you know baby steps towards that. I guess creating some of these. Um, you know, specialist roles where maybe teaching or research output to, are not the measure of, um, of, of success uh, necessarily, and so you can still get promoted. But I still don't think that there's a genuine sense in that community that there's a, a pathway for them. Um, so I think that that's the first thing we can do. And it doesn't just have to be in the academic environment. You know, I touched on it before. There are organisations like Oscope that could create you know, roles in our discipline area. Um, ARDC, other groups like that can do similar things, I think. So I think there are opportunities for us to create some specialists who have the capacity to be agile and move from project to project uh, and be called on by different groups, different areas, different organisations um, to provide support. Um, I think there's another aspect to it as well, and that's just understanding where the skills are that we already have. So, uh, you know, Rosie talked about the, the skills framework. I think the flip side of that is, is kind of doing the skills audit. Um, and I think that that's really hard. And we've thought a bit about that in, in our space, not specifically to do with digital skills, but uh, as a community, we did some work a few years ago trying to understand we were interested in exploring for minerals undercover, you know, in a, in a difficult environment, how do we find new mineral deposits? And so there was an audit done of all of the universities, who had skills in this area? And the heads of department were all contacted. Who's got skills in your department that relate to this? And they gave feedback and filled out the template and sent it back. And it didn't seem to correlate with what everybody understood to be the skills that people had. So then they went to the researchers and said, what skills do you actually have? And you know, they have completely different, or the, the self-assessed, they have a completely different set of skills to what the head of department thinks they've got. So how do we actually communicate that and make available those skills that people do have? And then it gives us an opportunity to build those skills and to identify which people might be wanting to go down one of these sort of more specialist um, digital paths. Okay, that's a great example of a, of a sort of a way of eliciting that type of information. I mean, wonder if anyone else wants to chime in with any sort of specific initiatives that they have in place around that um, workforce development activity. Yeah, I think I would yeah. have, um, I'd add things, but when you're sort of small university, you need people to have more skills um, and less sort of deep specialist skills. Um, really engaging a sort of skills matrix type approach has been what we've been doing to look at, well, where are our gaps in, in capability, but also what are those additional uh, skills and whether it is in, um, you know, that will augment uh, some of those digital skills, but uh, in terms of working with the community or researchers, actual community sort of co-designed sort of skills, what are those other things that you can um, add to their careers and also think about leadership opportunities, you know, leading programs or grants so they feel empowered to where their career's going and maybe where their passion, um, be able to follow that. So that's, a, that's sort of a little bit of a tool that we're, we're looking at as we're trying to understand what our capability set is across this space. I really think there's some great opportunities um, as we get more fair data, um, you know, once we've got some of those uh, fundamental practices embedded and it's much more doing research as, as normal rather than, um, you know, being something that's added on to research. And then I think, you know, what I think motivates people across our team is, is working collaboratively on, um, you know, significant problems uh, with others. So, you know, whether that's um, across NCRIS facilities or, you know, a, a, across, you know, different um, uh, nodes or, you know, uh, a aspects of, you know, Oscope or ARDC, actually getting people to learn more by um, doing together. Um, you know, I think that we can achieve um, through co-location, you know, through... Um, you know, a bit like internships or 
placements or whatever, um, mix it up a bit, you know, mm. actually give people a, a different um, experience uh, working into a different problem with a, a different team and, and for us if that team can involve you know, all the people that are trying to solve that problem rather than just the technologists on their own, hmm. um, you know, then that that um, creates a new aspect of people's roles that um, keeps them engaged and it wouldn't necessarily be something that they'd get uh, somewhere else. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we had a similar thing at Monash and did have a, um, a small initiative trying to work like that. So how do we get our uh, staff, how do we get our staff in the support platforms being seen as peers within research groups. Uh, and I do spend a bit of time talking to researchers, really talking about the fact that our staff should be seen as postdocs that you can hire for a short period of time in a particular embedding model. And so we've done a fair bit of that in the past where uh, a group will co-fund a staff member with a central platform, whether it's e-research or bioinformatics. Um, but I think the thing we need to take a little bit more of is how do we get that fluidity between the, the groups between the research groups and uh, our more central support platforms. Uh, and so we have tried the buying time from postdocs back into the central group. So both to bring their expertise uh, into a, a more central group so they can learn, but also then to bring that to another project. Uh, and so it's not always find funding from, from central and for a research group and hire somebody. It's get some funding and get some time from, some, from one of the research groups, perhaps push their research funding a little bit longer down the track uh, and get a bigger benefit for the university. Um, we've done a little bit of that. I'd like to do a bit more of that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's, it's come a, a couple of times, but I think one of the opportunities really is the passion that the people working in this space have for the, the opportunities that come out of working in this kind of cross-disciplinary mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I know from the experience of MDAP, uh, we have a fairly strong internship program that takes students from information technology, from data science, and then sort of adds them into some of these cross-disciplinary projects. And uh, it's massively in demand from students. I think they, they really have a great experience in terms of actually getting to see where those skills that they're learning in their coursework can be applied out in, a, out in the real world. Yeah. Okay, um, so Helen, I might turn to you next. And uh, we've talked a little bit about what a career pathway looks like from a, uh, a member of the digital research infrastructure workforce. When we think about our roles as um, directors of these organisations and our focus is on the sustainability of those workforce models, um, I was wondering if you'd like to comment on a vision for what a sustainable model of that for that workforce would look like. Again, we probably, I mean, everybody has to earn their own money, but yeah. we have very little central funding um, from the university. So our, our research and digital innovation agenda is created based on uh, I suppose looking out from the university and seeing what it is that the government and other partners want to achieve and then figuring out where we can add a, a value proposition uh, into that mix. So, um, you know, the skills side of that, um, as I said before, um, you, need a, you need to be having the skills that match up with the stage of maturity of, of those you're collaborating with. So you know, in areas like AI, if I had talked about AI a few years ago to our external partners and our research leads, you know, they wouldn't have had um, an appetite for it. So there would be not the need at that time to have people in the team with those specialist skills, but that can rapidly change. And, and so now, um, you know, that would be an area where, you know, how do, who do we partner with to upskill people that we've already got? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, certainly in IoT data, um, you know, soil moisture probes, weather stations, um, are, you know, working with farming systems groups and others around Australia so that we haven't just got reporting on an individual probe that, you know, we can see at a regional scale what's going on. You know, so suddenly we need those skills. Mm -hmm. um, and then how do we, how do we access yeah, and, and, and achieve? Um, because if you can't deliver on what your, your, your partners, whether they're other researchers in the university or our external partners, um, you know, then you miss the, the next opportunity. Mm. So yeah, we're, not, we're not afraid to partner with others if we haven't got the skills. And we like to do that in a way that um, 
our, our team members are involved in that process so that there is a transfer of knowledge, you know, through that um, uh, sharing some of the, you know, the funds with an external to get the, the ramp up of those speeds in the area, uh, the ramp up of the speed of knowledge in those areas where we now need them. Any thoughts from others on sustainability? I, I think this is something that's going to differ quite a lot by context. But, mm. yeah. Yes, hard, it's a hard question, <laughs> so, um, sustainability. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, a piece around sustainability and then, you know, um, job security too, because when you're working at, you know, what is the next project? What does that look like? How do you then build a career as well? And so those those challenges that move between there, but um, definitely need to lean into um, where you partner. Um, as I'm, you know, start to grow this skill set across the university, and there'll be a lot of uplift and data fluency type activities in there. But really, you know, are there opportunities to um, embed, learn from others, um, bring people together, uh, whether it is industry or other academic areas, um, will be something that, uh, you know, we'll absolutely uh, look at where, where there might be opportunities there for that level of sustainability. So not um, adverse of building and owning it all ourselves. It's, you know, um, leaning in and, you know, hopefully helping make other capabilities sustainable across the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So how do you tap into that and is there capacity in those areas would be what are we looking for. Mm. Yeah. No, that network model is really appealing, I think. And it, it also, I mean, it leads into that question that we've talked about workforce retention and some of the challenges of retaining a workforce when there are sort of more lucrative opportunities out there, perhaps, um, even if less interesting. Uh, but it would be nice to see, I guess, if there was a sort of a cycling of people through those different opportunities rather than just seeing it as a drain from, um, you, know, uh, you know, research infrastructure organisations in academia or otherwise to, to industry. Um, Helen, you mentioned that you had people, you know, coming in from, you know, in the other direction, right, coming in at the end of career. Um, it, does that, is that sort of a conscious approach to uh, workforce career progression and career development? Yeah, and we do it at the other end of the scale too. So, um, in, in a project like visualising Australasia's so soils, some of what we, we need to do um, to make things sustainable is to replace human processes with you know, machine processes. So if we're trying to harmonise soils, you know, data, laboratory um, results from a whole range of different laboratories or whatever, and we bring, um, you know, at the moment we need one and a half people to do some of that harmonisation of the data that's coming in from, uh, you know, um, farming systems groups and catchment management authorities. Uh, at the end of the soil CRC funding, if we haven't built a pipeline for processing that data much more efficiently, then the sustainability of that initiative uh, is going to be uh, undermined. So we mm -hmm. have to find smarter ways, uh, you know, so when at the point where something's becoming repeatable, then we really need to program that, you know, uh, and then we need a different sort of a partnership between, you know, the scientists and the people who are doing the, uh, you know, the data harmonisation based on whatever standards and then get technology to replace as much as that manual process as possible. Mm -hmm. Can I just yeah. add, probably on a bit of an optimistic note, I hope, um, Rosie and I probably remember a time when NCRIS organisations were operating on year-to-year -year funding and, you know, it was impossible to provide any sustainability. Um, I think the federal government recognises this now and, you know, we're on a now a 10-year sort of cycle with five-year contracts with the Commonwealth. So that gives us, you know, more sightline of what the future looks like. One of our partners last week in the budget, Geoscience Australia, got 35 years of funding announced. So, you know, the federal government recognises that you do need to provide long-term funding now. The challenge is now on groups like ARDC and OSCOPE to be able to pass on those long-term commitments from the Commonwealth through to the contract level where people are employed within universities or whatever. So, you know, I know it's not the same for all organisations and some don't have the, the long-term funding, but I think that there's a recognition that that's what's needed and hopefully it's a, it's a trajectory we're on. I'll just add one thing. So, 
sustainability is obviously important. One of our jobs as leaders in this space is how do we make sure we, we sell the, the wins in this area, the value of it. Um, and we probably need to do this at the outset of just about all our programs and skills. How do we make sure we're clear on what success looks like and how we promote that? Uh, it's quite hard for us, in the, particularly in the infrastructure space. It's not seen as cool or sexy for most of our, our fields. Um, some of our researchers, say, use our big cryo-electron microscopes and absolutely require the big compute we have, but they don't see it, they don't know it, they don't generally acknowledge it. But so how do we sell, sell? How do we acknowledge the fact that that is so critical to our research um, across the board? And I guess the other side of that is to make sure we're clear on which parts have maybe done their part and seen the, the successes and maybe time to move on to the next thing. Um, we're very bad at that, I think, as a field. Is that point, I mean, it's something about the lag between when you're actually doing the work and when that work has impact? I mean, particularly when you have some of these larger projects, it can be quite a delay. Yeah, absolutely. We've talked about this for a long time. How do mm -hmm. we measure that impact around publications? But, uh, well, in the bioinformatics space, it was on average two years from the work being done to seeing that publication. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, that the research by the time they published it, forgotten <laughs> who to acknowledge. Um, not always. It's much better than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no. um, uh, fantastic. Okay. So, um, Julie, you've got an interesting perspective in that you've worked at a very large organisation and also now a, a smaller organisation as well. Um, what are some of the considerations that you find you need to address given the, you know, the, the and how do they differ from where you, you know, from the situation when you were in Monash? Yeah. yeah. So, I think um, the, the biggest difference is I don't have a team like David runs to just go, hey, <laughs> what does this look like? Or, you know, I see this skill set coming up. Um, understanding there's been uh, a little bit, and I think, you know, we were talking with Rosie earlier around the shift of, you know, funding projects, seeing going from a project to a programmatic view, understanding where if we're, you know, collecting data or building data sets, what does that look like in the life cycle? So. Um, how do we uplift as the university the right skills um, across the researchers, but what are those new roles that we need to make sure we've got some level of, you know, um, in terms we're meeting those management governance, security um, sort of basic um, standards across there. So I see, um, you know, different challenges from, um, but, you know, different domains. Mm -hmm. um, but similar sort of challenges across, whether it's large or small. We're also campuses over uh, three states and territory, and so uh, making sure there's the consistency there, but from the breadth of capability people can draw on, doesn't necessarily be in physical, so how do you, from a hybrid or um, remote area, be able to um, support the research mm. and enable the researchers in that space? So. Um, you know, something very much has been um, the, our past strategy of research intensification is now really looking out and saying, who do we work with? How do we partner? What are the skills that we need to um, work with? Because we've got a lot to bring to the table and a lot of research strength there, but not necessarily, as I said before, build and own it all mm -hmm. and, and, and you where there's capability um, that we might be able to help underpin and, you know, like support and, and sustainability and build out other teams that might connect in as well. So I think that ecosystem network approach is something that um, really are looking at mm. to build across there. Fantastic, thank you. And, and I think that um, uh, when you think about the, the remote delivery of work, I mean, obviously that's something that everyone has had to accustom themselves to over recent years. And I wonder if the, you know, sometimes the research itself, it's perfectly viable to do that remotely, but sometimes it's the outreach activities and it's that getting yourself in front of the researchers, which is more challenging when you're not actually physically, you know, physically there to, to engage. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and I think it, it is, you know, the information, making sure there is the, the right um, awareness across where they need to tap into the skills, how to, that it is important as part of their research programs. So starting to see a number of the, the, the applications and the grants coming in, is the digital um, space being considered appropriately? That's been some of my questions over the last six months as I've been meeting um, people across the university. Well, there's these amazing data sets around workforce and 
um, longitudinal studies, but what's the data um, mm. considerations there? So, and I think it's, you know, maturing that over time. I think small is beautiful. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I think I think when you're small, you can actually build the relationships uh, uh, a lot is more easily. Um, so we're across mm. multiple campuses as well. Um, uh, you know, we've we've got a real strength in 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 the digital side of things. Um, our centre has been established for 25 years. Most of the research centres in the university have been less than three years. Mm. Um, you know, so we just have to be proactive in in organising those conversations and making sure that we continue them. Um, so, an example with the Future Regions Research Centre, where they manage a, 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 a arid zone station, Nanya. Um, you know, and we've been doing work in rangelands. You know, uh, through one of the cooperative research centres that we're involved in, seeing the opportunity to join the dots. You know, mm -hmm. that we've got a very, dis not necessarily disturbed, but a, an agriculture pro production function on a landscape. And then we've got one that's been undisturbed. You know, what opportunities might that mm -hmm. provide? If only we had the same level of data for Nanya as, you know, um, we have for, you know, this agricultural company who owns 1% of the Australian landmass. You know, so just creating the excitement around the potential. If we just did things a bit differently and you tapped into some of our skills, then maybe, you know, we can actually do something quite um, significant here. So, yeah, I think it, you're very lucky to be at a smaller <laughs> institution. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. You always read my mind. My next yeah. question was going to be like, is there anything that's easier or better about being in a small organisation? Uh, yeah, that, that, so yeah, that's answered that perfectly. Yeah yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And I think pulling together the conversation in the university of what is important. We were talking in the tea break. There's a lot of politics in large universities, and and how do, how do you actually be heard? Um, you know, that's totally different. So yeah, there's some pros and cons there. Yep, yep. I'm, I'm not going to argue against that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, David, I might turn to, to you with a question now and, and thinking, um, looking ahead and looking to the future and what the, you know, so we've, we've talked a little bit about opportunities, but focusing specifically on the skills, where are there, um, you know, where should we be looking forward to at the moment in terms of thinking about the pathways that we create for our digital research workforces? Um, so, here's your question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there's the obvious answers around the emerging uh, tech, but I don't think that is where the focus should be. I think the focus is in those general skills. We need general understanding uh, and understand a real basic of how technology data systems work. And then as long as we instill that curiosity within our staff, they can adapt to the, the field they need to work in. And so I think it's really that. It's not specific targeted skills, for a long-term future, it's the basic skills you need to get right to understand and the adaptability. So it's, we really look for staff. So we struggle to get staff uh, with the particular skills to run systems and have the right engagement in uh, our university. Um, but if we get adaptable people that have general skills, we find they're really successful. Uh, but they've got to have that passion for trying something different. And I think that's really what we want to try and get. So. How do you do that with skills and training? I think we do <laughs> weird and wonderful things in research and that's what we need to do in training. We need to give weird and wonderful problems to our, our people. Uh, and acknowledge that this isn't a linear path. There is, I don't know anybody, I think, uh, around my teams that has that path from where they started to where they are now. I certainly didn't and it's a meander and I think we need to embrace the fact that that is what careers will look like uh, and in my opinion should look like. Um, so, in terms of thinking of skills for the future, uh, I certainly try and tell my kids, just become aware of the way computing works, the way systems work, how you deal with data. Um, other than that, it, just enjoy the problem that you work on um, and make the most of the peers around you with uh, particular skills. Fantastic. Okay, I think this is going to be a difficult one to top, but would anyone else like to, to chime in with their views on the future? I reckon I can add a skill into that. I, I totally agree with what David's head. Um, I think one of the things we underestimate in this space is communication skills. Mm -hmm. So um, Hamish and I ran a conference 
last year with a bunch of uh, our colleagues from other NCRIS organisations in the beautifully named NISIF organisation, <laughs> which has got like lots of E's and lots of F's, I don't know how many of each, um, which is the National Earth and Environmental Science Facilities Forum. Uh, but it was called Integrated Earth and it was, the intention was to look at how we can integrate data from across a whole bunch of discipline areas to answer big questions about climate change and sustainability and habitability and all of that sort of thing. Um, and we expected that the conference was going to focus on data the whole time. It was going to be talking about data, but what we found out was that there was no common language that we could all use to, to discuss the data. So we couldn't even get to the data because we couldn't talk to each other. And we've got an example of that with one of our projects where we had this idea to build this digital widget and we had some uh, discipline area experts who were involved and we had a uh, system engineer who was running it and we thought this is going to be perfect because the engineer has you know, got all this project management skills and understands coding and we've got all these disciplinary people. And in the meetings, they literally, they couldn't communicate with each other. There was no Babelfish in between to allow them to interface. So, like, it was a disaster, you know. So, how do you find those people that can fit between the, the really specific skill set required to build the thing and the people who understand the problem that the thing is trying to address and sit in, bes in between? And for me, that's a, that's a DNRI skill that I don't know how you find those people. I think they're rare, but I think that they have to dip into both sides of the equation to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah I agree 100% with all of that. Um, I, I, yeah, and again, we do the, the co-location of the domain specialists, the geologists, the soil scientists, the environmental scientists, the social scientists with the technologists in, in the same, on the same floor in the same building. Um, and it takes time. So, you know, it, it, if I think about uh, a researcher who first came to us after doing a postdoc and her, her field of research in terms of specialisation is way to birds, uh, and we were asking her to work, work, work into a whole range of different partnerships, you know, broadly around, you know, environment, and then it moved into agriculture sort of partnerships. But during that journey over the last few years, she's uh, been able to identify opportunities in her own research domain, you know, with her colleagues nationally and internationally for them to do things in their own domain differently because of the exposure she's had to, um, you know, the technology platforms and citizen science tools that were, you know, in whale watch or bogon moth tracking or whatever. Uh, and, and, it, and it has become much more a strength for her to talk all of that language of technology to her environmental um, research peers mm -hmm. and, and she's been able to advocate for you know, a change in the way that her peers do things going forward but it, it doesn't happen. It, it, those skills weren't there three years ago. No. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, okay. Um, we might now uh, invite questions from the audience um, online or in the room. Uh, Stick your hand up, or I think you can type a question in if you're online, and we'll it'll come through. Oh, there are microphones coming around, so. I think so. No, I'm Gomati. I'm the director for um, digital research and data strategy at Monash, working in the PDCRI office. Um, and um, in the last one year, I've spent a lot of time writing our seven-year strategy for digital research. Uh, it's been very interesting to uncover. I mean, most of the challenges we know about, but um, when you pay much more attention than what, we, what you would pay on a regular basis, you kind of uncover so many things, right? And, and I remember when we first presented, Rosie was like, let's double click on digital skills. Let's double click on what is it career path means. So we know it's a real problem, right? And, and we know that there's not many um, solutions in hand. Um, so for example, when we speak about be it a career path, we, we know that people are here because people are passionate about it. And people are here because they want to um, solve the problems. Uh, we also know that we don't compete with industry in terms of funding or, or the payment, and we also know that we are constrained by a number of years of funding. Are. So we're really working with a lot of constraints and still spe speaking about 
how do we build this career path? How do we build sustainability into, into our workforce? Um, which kind of forces us to think more innovatively around how we, we, we should solve, right? And I want to just go back to Julie's idea around we need to think about ecosystem. It's not about, I mean, as a university, we have been putting some time and effort to explore what does it take for, for building a career path. So many challenges. You can't just easily build a career path within a university. So, but we are a big ecosystem. I mean, we consider how many universities are here and how many NCRS facilities are here. How can we bring that together to start thinking about um, what is a career path across the ecosystem? How can we expand that ecosystem to think beyond universities and increase facilities and bring in industry? Oh my God, there's Amazon, NVIDIA, so many um, industry partners working on kind of solving research problems as well. They wanted to invest time. They wanted to come and work with us. So how can we build that partnership, bring them into the ecosystem and expand our our skill base, let our people move out, and mm -hmm. let bring more people into our workforce. And I think that that's more of a coordinated effort. No one organization can do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I would look at this forum to think about. Can we think about expanding that ecosystem? Can we think about bringing more approaches to expand uh, and move across the ecosystem? So yeah, just, just a comment more than a question, but uh, yeah, thanks. I oh, know, I was going to throw that question to David. You know, how can we expand our... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I'll, I'll just invite the... any responses to <laughs> that. I think it's a fantastic idea, by the way. I'll take the opportunity to plug uh, the fact we have eResearch Australia running in Melbourne. And <laughs> we need to encourage our staff to come and collect, connect with their peers. Uh, you get to do it in research domains when you go to a conference. Uh, we need to make sure our technology specialists, the digital skills people, are connecting with peers. I know our HPC experts have Slack channels across institutes with experts in it that I don't get invited to because um, I don't have the secret handshake, but they do and, <laughs> and they share expertise. We need this across the different domains so they can share with peers. Probably none of us have groups big enough to have that collective expertise, but across, as Kamathi said, across all our groups we do. So how do we encourage the specific domains to connect? Um, and so my plug for eResearch Australia has been one of those. Um, David, do you, um, you may mention this important, I think it was, uh, I think it was your team, sorry. I men mentioned the important skill of the, of the connector um, or the uh, understanding different languages across disciplines. I was thinking it's kind of a research broker of sorts um, and it's not something that we're familiar with, I'm familiar with in academia at least, um, but I know, you know, I'm trying to make an analogy to the, um, I was going to say the real world. Um, sorry, <laughs> um, to industry, um, and I'm wondering how how do we? If I I totally agree. I think it's a really important role because you can be just running in parallel and never actually um, talking together. And I'm wondering how how we uh, how we would advertise for that kind of role, and how would you make it attractive to to someone who might m want to move just slightly left of centre outside of their academic track or outside of their professional track and be somewhere in the middle, right? We talk about the third space all the time, but that's, that's one of those critical roles. Um, but <laughs> how do we sell it and how do, they, how do they get enough? Where's the incentive to, to play that role, do you think? I, I, don't know, that's, I don't know if it's an answerable question, but it's, I'm, just, I'm just trying to pull it out a bit more because I like the idea of, of that kind of role being something that we should all be thinking about, you know, working into our teams. Yeah, I think it was me that raised it. I think it was... Um, I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll let Tim answer the question. I think, it's, um, I think it's really hard. I think that there's no established pathway into that, right? Like, it, it, And it'll suit some people's personalities and skill sets and not others. So, um, you know, I made fun of my sort of brief programming career, but it actually probably did set me up for the roles that I've had subsequently because even though I couldn't code to save my life now, I understand enough, I, I do understand the language. So I can talk to people who are coding as well as people who are geoscientists and I can, I can bridge that gap a little bit. So I think it's finding the people that are, uh, you know, interested enough in it, but maybe don't want, to, don't want to go down the full technical path, but to provide the upskilling that they need so that they can 
they can bridge that gap. And then the other way as well, right? So we also did this really cool project with Nikta back when it was Nikta before it was Data61, um, which was looking at um, using Bayesian inversion to search for um, geothermal reservoirs and stuff. And it was all this multi-physics inversion and stuff. It was really cool. And it was interesting because we were dealing with all of these really young, really, really young computer scientists who and mathematicians who were totally unencumbered by any geological knowledge. And I mean that in the best possible way. Because <laughs> they were asking us all these questions that we never would have thought of, right? Like, oh. but why isn't there a relationship between this and this? And we said, well, because of course there's not. And they said, but there is. You can see it in the data. And we're like, oh, jeez, I have to think about that now. <laughs> and so it's actually like this really positive relationship when you get people from outside your discipline area who are just learning enough about what you're interested in to ask really telling questions. So um, working out ways to upskill the technical people in the discipline stuff as well as the other way around, I think, is the challenge. And I mean, ARDC already does this in some areas really, really well. So for, the, for those uh, data skills particularly, but I think we can broaden that out. I, I don't know, um, you know, but if, and it's not happening in Federation broadly, but you know, I, I've seen it in CSIRO where they have a project of a certain size and then the internal kickoff meetings have, you know, their data and research, data infrastructure specialist teams as a part of those, you know, kickoff conversations. So that's where you probably have everybody who's going to be involved in the delivering the project, you know, hearing about a comprehensive overview of it. And then, um, you know, th those people with the technology skills and, and you know, data and other capabilities um, are listening for the opportunities where they can add value to what what's occurring. So yeah, whether there's a tipping point in our organisations where, you know, something of a, of a particular size or scale that we're actively, you know, and consistently um, at the table when those um, project implementation plans are, are being firmed up because we've actually got the the money or the contract or whatever it is, I think that would change. Because we really got to create a demand for the digital research infrastructure capability and expertise. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people, if it hasn't been part of their way they deliver their research, they don't know what value could be added. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just add one thing. Uh, one of the, I think, is we encourage our staff to make sure that it's not their job just to solve the technical <coughs> problem. It's their, it's their job to understand the research question. I didn't do biology in high school and knew very little, and now I know a fair bit about uh, genomics and transcriptomics and all sorts of things, because biologists, researchers love to talk about their work <laughs> and they love to learn it because um, you know, that's why we do the job. But we should, be we should be encouraging that. I have students that say they want to be data scientist experts. I'm like, that's awesome, do that, it's a really useful skill. But get something deep in a domain to show that you can translate that technical work mm -hmm. in data science to at least one domain, and that bring, makes you much more employable mm -hmm. down the track. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that ARDC is doing at the moment is partnering with Helen's team and, and Federation Uni, and we have, um, I think it's 7.4 FTE of the Federation Uni staff joining the ARDC for 12 months. So it's a, it's a secondment. Um, so with that in mind, I've got a question particularly uh, in the NISIF space, all those E's and <laughs> F's and all that kind of stuff. Um, Tim, you spoke about the challenge in the Integrated Earth Conference for people to communicate without that shared language. Do you think there would be an opportunity if we were to create roles for NISIF with the, with the notion that uh, the, the staff member over a period of time, maybe it's a three year role or something, would spend time with more than one NISA facility. And by doing that, there'd be the, the sharing of language and cross fertilization. Do you think it's building on Kamathi's comment about broadening the ecosystem so we're looking beyond a single increased capability? I think it's, yeah, I, I think it's definitely part of the solution. I, I really do. I think we've scratched, like we've talked about it a few times in these meetings and 
just scratched the surface and it's always seemed too hard to work out the mechanics of it, but I, I do think that there's a real desire for it. Um, and, and particularly in organisations like Oscope and Turn and, and groups like ours who, who aren't big enough to have those real specialists available to us, but you know, when we do find somebody and we, we have them on staff, we, you know, we tend to lose them to groups, you know, and not like we're competing, but, you know, you know Access NRI can offer them a, a pathway that might be more appealing to those people than in a, a smaller yes. research space like Oscope. So to find people that can actually dip into all of those projects, I think it would be so good for their, for their careers because they're not yes. just stuck in geoscience looking at rocks, they're looking at animals and they're looking at the sky and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think it would be fantastic. Yeah. We should do this. <laughs> uh, thanks. Amanda Lawrence from RMIT. Um, I was just wondering about, we've talked a lot about skills and careers pathways for research infrastructure type roles. I'm just wondering how that intersects with actual researcher roles. Uh, you know, it, it's often considered you know, there's the teaching and there's research. So you ask a researcher to do some sort of research infrastructure role and, you know, it doesn't fit into either of those and potentially it comes away from their research time. Uh, and, and so is there a conversation that we need to have, uh, you know, with the, the, the university system more broadly about how research infrastructure actually fits into some of those, uh, into the research role in some way. I'll jump in quickly. <laughs> yeah, look, absolutely, Amanda. I mean, that's, it's an ongoing challenge to get recognition for the work that those people do. It's, it's really, really difficult. You know, Nick and I were talking before, Nick's got the same problem at <laughs> Melbourne. So, you know, it, it's really, really hard um, to get the university to value the work that they do. But it's hard for us structurally as well, because we can, you know, at Oscope, I can pay the salary of a postdoc if that person is just building some research infrastructure with the time out of their salary I pay. But I can't pay for them to go to a conference and I can't pay for them to do research. So if they're collecting a data set that's a national data set, I can support that, but I can't support, and if they're operating an instrument, I can support that. Writing code, I can support that. But as soon as it moves into the research space, then that's out of bounds for us. So. Um, there are some real structural challenges as well that make it very difficult to create roles that are appealing to people to work in because they're managing their time and jumping between one thing and another and they're not getting recognised for half of what they do. Maybe I'll also jump in there just to, I mean, I think we do have a bit of an advantage here at the University of Melbourne in that the University of Melbourne does have an academic specialist role which uh, enables people to be employed as academics um, but to be recognised for their contributions to academic research rather than um, specifically for leading and driving. Uh, and all of the 20 or so uh, research data specialists within MDAT are employed as academic specialists. Now, um, it's existed for some time in the University of Melbourne. It's a continuing sort of uh, work in progress in terms of actually uh, defining how that uh, work category is recognised and um, uh, and, and rewarded for what they do, especially considering that it covers a wide range of um, people doing very, very diverse activities across all, the whole university. Uh, but I think the, the university has at least its heart in the right place in terms of um, uh, creating the organisational frameworks that allow for that conversation to happen and to allow for people to um, be recognised. And we've had success in getting people promoted on the basis of their work as contributors to research and you know, critical supports to research without necessarily being you know, CIA or lead author on the publication. Mm. Oh, for my question. Yes. Okay, a, a question from the online audience. Um, a slightly different tack. Uh, a lot of this has been focused in Australia and talking about this Australian community. But the question here is, is there, um, um, have the, any of the panel members explored outsourced work from approved international companies to provide uh, in tech coverage in high workload periods? Um, although there may be acknowledging IP, ethics, limitations and other foreign considerations, especially when you start thinking about AI. I just had, I just had a, a panel response come back. Oh my goodness, there's so many companies. Um, so, you know, uh, yes, our university did put um, a call out for some of the um, technical debt type work and testing environment framework um, activity that you know, you either put up an internal 
uh, case for um, employing people to do some of these functions. Uh, and then the university wants to market text test. So yeah, we're in the middle of, of one of those assessing, you know, um, uh, the the value proposition of one versus the other. I mean, the daily rates are, are still, even if they're international, are still high. And if you want to retain some of those skills um, uh, within your team longer term, you know, to actually run those infrastructures, um, you've got to weigh all of that up as well. So yes, we certainly look to the most economic and um, taking into account all of the cyber security and uh, information um, that needs to stay uh, in Australia. But we've never actually, in our team, we've never actually done it, but that was the university's pathway when we put up a business case to employ two people, uh, was to go uh, through the panels and, and get um, yeah, daily rate cards and um, proposals. Uh, yeah, so I'll come in. Monash has certainly outsourced particular types of work, like um, software development can get done by software development houses, and it works quite well when you have a very clear statement of work up front. Uh, unfortunately, most research doesn't work very well with a statement of work up front. Um, <laughs> And it became really obvious in some of the genomic space I work where uh, work was done overseas in some of this. And the work would come from the researcher back to us to say, can you please explain these results? Which really just meant redoing everything and doing it right. Because, and, and it's not right for any arrogant reason we did better. It was just that you need that interaction back and forth. And it is hard to outsource that close interaction. Mm. One should think that the digital research space should be boosting with innovations. And if we look at the, uh, the ecosystems in Europe and the US, we can see that multiple things happen in that space. Uh, from the commercial end, the large companies run uh, large academic programs within the universities. There are spins off, spin offs. Uh, from the universities, there's uh, talent flow from the universities to the companies. A lot's happening. What's happening in Australia? What are we doing not quite right? What can we? What should we change to be more like uh, those Europe or US? Some billion-dollar VC funds would help. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, yeah, look, I spent a little bit, very short amount of time working over in the US, and it was really a different attitude of that moving in and out of the university. It just doesn't seem to happen here very well. Mm -hmm. that, you know, come up with an idea, move out, do a startup, fail, and move back. <laughs> and we laugh, right? But uh, we, we, I don't know, our English background, something about our culture, we don't like that fail part, uh, and yet we need to do it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have an answer. No. And I wonder whether you know the environment allows that time for innovation and thinking through, it feels, you know, everyone's at capacity or over to the day to day gets in the way to be able to, you know, that great idea or that mechanism to move that through and just doesn't seem to, I don't know, create, you know, the opportunity or the space to maybe um, think a bit more broadly around what those innovations may look like. So I think, you know, internally, you know, being able to find and I suppose empower staff to think about uh, those sorts of things is um, it, you know, probably just don't do that very well. Mm. It is a timeline situation as well, isn't mm. it? Because if your funding runs through to the end of the year and you have to deliver to something before your funding runs out. And so, I mean, maybe in that optimistic note, if there is a recognition that you know, longer term investment is needed for that. Mm. I'm not sure that I totally accept that it's not happening here either. I mean, if you look at some of our, so, you know, some of the broader research environment organisations like CSIRO, you know, they're they're spinning up lots of startups who are often successful in this space and others. You look at um, Anf, you know, in the Encra space, they're working with startups all the time. It's not in the digital space, but it's in the fabrication space. You know, so there's, I think there is still a culture of that, uh, but. Maybe we don't have the size of the investment community in Australia to support it in the digital space yet. I'm not sure. Uh, ab 
apologies. Does it work? Yeah, it does work. Uh, probably the, the question would be like a bit uh, like on the form, like a bit raw, because you know I was just just thinking about what Slava said and basically like about all what what the panels mem members were, were discussing. So one of the problems uh, in uh, uh, like retaining. Uh, basically running long-term projects like running uh, sustainable infrastructure I would say is obviously funding so uh, which is which is like uh, always was it always not enough like in, in, in this area so uh, um, and uh, somehow like related to what Slava said uh, like this uh, um, what universities do have and they don't actually think realize they have is that uh, is um, that they have to survive on very um, you know, like um, on very, very like on very limited amount of resources, and they actually have a lot of experience in that area. Uh, I'm, I'm <coughs> coming from like I, I worked a bit like in the in, in the industry, and uh, uh, what like uh, obviously like the, the the pay rates there like is, is 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 quite high. But what they don't actually have is they don't have well established practices that universities normally do because like universities normally have like well the brightest actually people in the area. Uh, but I'm just 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 saying, saying this shamelessly because well they they, they do, uh, and if you just go back to the industry, you will see that like the the level of the like average IT practice that they have like an average software company is just you know it's like ten years behind, like so one thing is I don't know how to make money out of it, but maybe just the universities can just go back at the moment we're just purchasing things from industries. Can we just go back and just somehow like you know sell our experience? Maybe just. I don't know, like somehow sell our experience of making like the cheap, like the cheapest available possible infrastructure systems because we know how to do this and it mm -hmm. works. <laughs> so, I, again, like I don't have an answer. Like if I knew how to do this, I would be probably like, just out there, just you know, making something like that. But you know, we have a lot of a lot of bright people here. So sorry, just yeah, just maybe like it's it's not not exactly a question. Maybe like a lot of time. yeah, thanks. Any responses to a business model that involves selling our ability <laughs> to make do with limited means? Yeah. Well, we do sell to teach people how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I <laughs> Question or not? Okay, a question from question from the uh, the, the virtual audience. Um, uh, so there's been changes in the Fair Work Amendments, and uh, what, what has that had any repercussions on your organisations? Uh, as many of the uh, research infrastructure staff are linked to fixed-term contracts, how are you going to respond to that? <laughs> I think um, we just had uh, a voluntary redundancy round at our university. Um, I would never have been concerned about them before because none of our team would have been eligible to participate because. The whole team, until very recently, were all on fixed-term contracts, and some of those had rolled um, for more than 20 years. Um, so it's had a, a very significant impact in that probably at least half of the team now have continuing appointments um, with the university. So, um, you know, for the first time, the university, um, well, they, I mean, they looked at the numbers and the, and the continuous uh, um, track record in terms of um, revenue outcomes, but then there was also the legal requirement to um, come in to change those. Um, you can't roll the third, third contract, basically. Um, so yes, it's had a, a, a very beneficial impact for for members of, of my team because, um, I mean, if, it, if something should ever happen and our centre isn't viable or there's a change of management in the future and they say this is not something we we now need to be doing, at least those staff could be paid out um, very well. Yeah, we haven't spoken too much about it, but um, we do struggle sometimes to get staff to move from a postdoc into a research infrastructure, maybe not seen as glamorous, I think I said before. Uh, one of the advantages should be a more secure contract, and I do think there's been benefit in this area that we give more ongoing contracts in this space to do that, um, and we should promote that as a possibility. I guess the other one is uh, universities not have always done the right thing with the casualisation mm -hmm. of staff. Mm -hmm. But we need to make sure that's nuanced right in our space. We do pay a number of students to provide casual support and it's a great benefit to them. They like it and, they, um, and they're a benefit to the centre. And so we need to make sure we are able to still do that, I think. Questions from the room or from online? Okay, 
Perhaps I'll just turn back to the, the panel then, and thank you very much for the discussion today. Is there anyone who is carrying a burning statement that they would like to make before we, we conclude for today? No, you've all said your piece. I, I just oh. one, one comment, and you know, I look, look at this room and I sort of think, you know, in terms of the interactions, like a profile of what these roles are, sometimes comes down to a skills matrix or, but I mean, why people are engaged in research and think we think about, um, you know, impact stories and things like that. If everyone in this room actually said, you know, I worked on this amazing project and I had, you know, this was my impact, that tells a whole, I mean, I'm sure it would be huge breadth, which would be really surprising to everyone or to industry. And I don't think we tell enough of those sort of stories of, of what that role is, why people are passionate about it. Um, you can put a PD out there and you say you work on these sorts of areas, but, you know, if you think you discovered a new genome or, you, di you know, there's a contribution there that I don't think is told. And I think that's maybe something that maybe profiling could help, you know, in terms of one, feeling like you have contributed, but also understanding the breadth and expertise and value in the room. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, Julie, Helen, Tim, David, thank you very much for being on the panel and I will pass back over to Rosie now for the concluding remarks. Thank you, Nick. Um, so thank you to everyone uh, for your contributions this afternoon for this interesting and incredibly timely discussion. Um, not only those in the room, but you um, participating virtually as well. Thank you for joining us. I also, of course, want to thank um, all of the ARDC staff that have made this afternoon possible. Um, a big thank you to those that have contributed to bringing the program together, to Asha, can't see where you are. There you are, Asha, uh, for organising the venue and the virtual component. Um, the team are now in our, I think, third year of the Leadership Forum, really making this um, sing very sweetly. So thanks to all of the staff present that made this event so successful this afternoon. I want to share something with you that I, I heard this afternoon and... and gave me a thought. We heard a lot about how these roles weren't perhaps the most uh, glamorous, I think was the word. I can see David smiling there. Not the most glamorous. I want to share something with you that I think is really wonderful. And the ARDC staff, most of them in the room, in fact probably all of them in the room, don't know it yet. So we have just completed um, our annual staff survey and every year we're seeking to look at things like enablement and leadership and strategy, yada, 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 all those things you know about. What really matters, what really matters in this conversation is 91% of the staff that responded to that survey felt they had either very strongly agree or strongly agree with the comment that the work gave them a real sense of purpose. And I think it's taking that, it might not be glamorous, but we're hinting, you know, talking about the profiling that Julie's describing, talk about sharing the stories of impact. What we're doing is allowing us to create an environment that gives us a sense of purpose. And I think we all recognise the importance of that to a really um, balanced and successful life for an individual. And I, I'm, I, I'm wittering because I'm delighted that we're in this position. So I'll return to the script. Um, and I've been told a couple of quick notes to share with you um, before we all have a, a, a beverage and a chance to continue the discussion. So the ARDC Annual Digital Research Skills Summit kicks off tomorrow. Um, and that's building on today's forum on digital research infrastructure, but the program's taking a bit of a different turn. Uh, the participants will hear from the leads of several ARDC partnered research infrastructure initiatives, sharing some of those real world case studies. 
tackling the challenges, the roadblocks, um, the exciting possibilities for engagement with the users and upskilling. And the audience will be a blend of infrastructure providers, researchers and skills trainers coming together to swap stories and sharing those insights. So we're looking for sharing best practices, proven approaches and even what not to do when fostering seamless user experiences and building connected and skilled user communities. Um, so that's just tomorrow. <laughs> On Thursday... <laughs> Oh boy, uh, we joined the ARDC skilled workforce team for an interactive day of talks, workshops, networking with the Australian carpentries community. I did sign the contract this morning, we're good for it. Uh, skills trainers and researchers looking to share uh, training experiences and expertise. You've heard David speaking about e-research Australasia. That will be here in Melbourne uh, in October last week in October, I think, one of the things we're really keen on exploring is creating an environment for research infrastructure professionals to come together and network and see if we can seed uh, a really grassroots community um, and cre create a space for, um, I think I'm going to say, Kamathi's bigger ecosystem coming through there. Uh, so that's eResearch Australasia. And... IDW, International Data Week, is coming to Australia next year. It's going to be up in Brisbane. Um, this conference takes place every couple of years, and we've been able to bring it down to the Southern Hemisphere. It's the Research Data Alliance, WDS, and CoData. It's the big of the big. It's coming to Brisbane. You have the hot seats ready to participate in that exciting uh, activity. So that's all the plugs I can think of um, just for the moment. So in conclusion, my um, sincere thanks to all of you for joining, but particularly join me in thanking the panel, those that knew they were on the panel last week and those that found out yesterday, um, and to Nick for doing an absolutely superb job of guiding us through a fantastic conversation. Thank you all so much. <laughs>